All right. Good afternoon, ma'am. Would you introduce yourself for the record? Tell us your name and DNC number. Carlene Fleming, 120686. All right, Ms. Fleming, you're uh, familiar with the uh, process. You're here for a parole hearing today. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. You are currently serving a 99-year sentence for a first-degree murder conviction in Arlene's Parish. It is. It was commuted from life um, to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility in May of 2022. So uh, I don't see that there are any guests here for you today. So, and you know the process, so we're gonna just jump right in. Your case has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson, so would you answer her question? Who? I can't Ms. Jackson. Ms. Okay. Jackson is going to ask me the questions. Good afternoon, Ms. Fleming. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, I can. All right, my name is Bonnie Jackson. I will be uh, starting the question for the board. Uh, Ms. Fleming, you were convicted of a first degree murder and you received a commutation of sentence with parole eligibility after 35 years. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How old are you, Ms. Fleming? 63. How much time have you actually served on this charge? Almost in October. In November, it will be 63. So we've already counted as 63. So about 35 and a half. 30? A little over than that. I have 34. Does that sound? 1986, November 18th is when I, November 21st, 1986 is when I was locked up. All right, all right, thank you. Uh, you had some co-defendants in your case, you and two other people were uh, indicted for and charged with killing your husband, George Fleming. Is that correct? Yes, it was, but I was based on conspiracy at first. And then when, after they used the conspiracy in the trial, then they dropped the conspiracy charge. But I understand, but you were charged, you yeah. were convicted of murder. Yes. But there were two other people involved in the act commission of the crime. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Friends of my brother. Yes. So tell us what your role was in the crime. What did you do? What, and why did you want Mr. Fleming killed? I wish I could bring Miss Paul in here who works in administration because because right before the flood, she found out why I was really here. And I, I was blown away because I didn't think anybody knew other than Helen Travis. What do you mean why you I was originally accused of covering for my mom and my brother. And as I told the board when I went to the parole board, pardon board, and the feds wrote them before I went, because I wrote them, I said, look, anything you had that cleared me, because in 95, I had a full pardon unanimous vote. I had Judge Adrian DePlanchade there, but he's dead now. I was originally accused of covering for my mom and my brother. When I did not speak up, then it was put in my lap. But it's like she put it, my dad was really big wig with the feds and I was scared of him. He said, you say one word against your mom and your brother and I'll see you get your, no legal help. Since then and I've had, you know, it's Fleming, interesting. Fleming, Fleming, I'm gonna stop you right here, okay? I'm gonna stop you right there. Okay. We have the full file, the full report on your case. Mm -hmm. Have that before we start this process. And so when we ask you what happened, it's not because we don't know. Okay. okay. Um, at the time, I was in traction waiting for pelvic for uh, back surgery. I was almost nine, nine weeks pregnant after five mis four miscarriages. He started coming home. He'd turn off all the lights, peek out around the curtain. He started taking his gun with him to work. I was scared. I did not know what was going on. You know, I talked to my dad about it. I talked to my family about it. I said, you know, because we decided we didn't want to become like people we knew. We wanted to stay married. I was 24. He was 30 when we first got married. We'd been knowing each other for years. And so I wanted to know what was going on. And then next thing I know, one thing after another is happening around me. And I didn't believe it. When I started hearing right. him talk, 
What's she saying? Things don't just start happening around uh, you. When you I complained, when I complained and I kept telling them what was going on, okay? Oh, we're going to take care of it. My brother, we're going to take care of it. We're going to take care of it. And next thing you know, I'm in the middle of this stuff. And I said, I'm thinking, you know, I, could, I couldn't believe that he was serious, but he was serious. And a friend of mine who is an attorney told me, go to the people, go to the police. And I said, oh, man, they're just blown off steam. I'm not going to take that serious. He said, it's serious. And I didn't. I, mean, I, mean. I didn't go. And then it happened. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about some other things. Um, what kind of programs have you taken since your incarceration? I have taken everything that they have to offer, including going to the seminary, I, yeah. Oh, I don't know what you mean by everything oh, they have. Sorry. I would like to know what programs okay. they and, and which ones had the most effect on you. And what did you learn from those programs? The grief counseling was, was awesome. I love that. But life healing choices for me was the best. And then I later well, in... Uh, I thought, what was life healing choices addressing for you? Wow. It made me realize that God's God and I'm not. Okay. Mm -hmm. I bet. It's the thing that Rick Warren says. He said, one of the first things we have to learn about getting out of our way. He says to learn that God is God and we're not. We can't well, sit there and try to control a situation. And we have to go through God in order to be able to get anything done. You can't get anything done. You can't get anything in your life without that. You can't. It's bottom line. You. The only thing that kept me surviving this many years, and I tell the youngsters, was God. Because only God could have done it. I can't, couldn't have done it by myself. Let's, let's move on to something else. Um, where's your family? Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Most of, I've wow. outlived everybody. I have one aunt and she's in, in uh, Ocean Springs. She's almost 80. And the other aunt is 98 and she lives in Dover, Ohio. So you have no sibling? I have one. I have no idea where, what, and where. I have no idea. He sent dead body pictures to the prison once and scared the hell out of me in 2014. I don't want to know where he is. That's the one that I was accused of not talking for against. Dr. Sharkey was here, who's here today. She was there when the body, the pictures came to the mailroom. Are you receiving any kind of medical treatment? Any medical what? Treatment? He oh, he can't yeah. see it. Yeah. I'm in a wheelchair. I've been in a wheelchair about 29 years almost, something like that. Um, I have hypothyroid. Uh, COVID tap danced in my lungs. My lungs were already scarred. My spine is extreme jigsaw puzzle. Um, my leg is like, like when your foot's his legs asleep and no tingles, but the foot's completely dead. Um, there's no muscles in the back. Um, I'm now are, you being are, are you being treated for any mental health condition? No, no, no. I've went in the seminary. We had to go through all the different things, the counseling class and tests and stuff. And um, well, I learned that I'm different. I'm an INTP, and it's like three percent of the population, but. You know, I've always always wondered why that was, and now I know. Let me ask you some more questions. If you don't have any family and you're in a wheelchair, where do you plan to live if you were successful 
today? I'm living with my aunt in Ocean Springs. She was always like an older sister to me. And have, I've been away from family too long. Stop talking for a moment. Has she written to the board or has anything taken place that says that she is willing to allow you to come and live with her? She was at the pardon board and she told him she was. She was supposed to be on Zoom or the telephone today. But the only thing I can guess is if she got on the phone at, at eight, she's a retired Mississippi school teacher. They only made 28 a year. And uh, yeah. I don't know if she went, I told her to go by Zoom. I don't know. I thought maybe she was, was here with y'all. I didn't know. So I take it you don't have an interstate compact to Mississippi, Not, nothing has been done, correct? They said they can't do it till after I go to the board today. Okay. Well, what, how would you support yourself? Well, two ways. They're getting me on the disability for now, and they're I make jewelry. That's how I paid for my pardon process. As a child, I went to all the gym and mineral shows. My dad was friends with all of them, and I learned how to make stuff. But and I do pretty good with it. But also, I have an offer to work, you know, as doing the counseling, but I can't do the counseling out there with a minor women's issue. So I have to tweak my degree by four classes if I want to do the same work out there that I did here. And here I did, I was counseling PTSD, sex traffic victims, um, survivors of childhood and domestic trauma. Did the DA, did they have a copy of my DA letter? The DA wrote me a letter in October 4th of 21, and he talked glowingly about the work I did working with sex traffic victims before COVID. And I don't think y'all have a copy of it. The DA New Orleans, uh, Jason Williams. Oh, that's there? No, that's not it. Anyway, he wrote me a letter talking glowingly. He believes highly in what I will do with myself once I'm out. I wrote him and thanked him and told him I would keep him up on what I do and how well I do. And it's Jason Williams, they wrote me a letter. The letter was originally addressed August 24th, 21, Governor Edwards, John Bell Edwards, two paragraphs. Did I, uh, did I hear from uh, the prison staff, please? She doesn't have it. Yes, ma'am. What can you tell us about Ms. Fleming? Ms. Uh, Fleming, um, you know, has been here for quite some time. Her last write-up is in was in 2013, but um, I know she had mentioned seminary. That, in that her. Was for a contraband. What was that? What was the contraband? Um, do you remember what the exact contraband was in 13? Uh, glass mirror and wooden frame. It was a glass mirror and wooden frame. What else can you tell us? Um, she you know, actually was one of our first tutors here at the facility for seminary um, and did a lot of work helping the other ladies with their um, seminary and educational backgrounds. Um, she hasn't been doing much of that just with some of her medical concerns, but um, she still obviously keeps up with her studies. And, Since Clyde, I've been doing the counseling. And the counseling, yes. Um. Do you all have a transition specialist? Yes, ma'am. Are they working with her in any way? Yes, ma'am. They were going to see how today went and then um, work on that interstate compact um, to finalize things with her aunt in Mississippi. Have they been in contact with the aunt in Mississippi? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Miss um, Fleming, you, I think you responded that you um, are not followed by mental health currently. Oh, yeah. No. Have you ever been followed by a mental health professional? I went to a sexual trauma class that the psychiatrist Dr. Bro had at one time. I did go, I went to that and she helped me through that because I had PTSD and I didn't even know it. 
Is there a statement you'd like to make to us before we go? All I can say is coming here has had many benefits. If that makes any sense, I know maybe it won't, but it's like I had a relationship with God at one time, but now it's not just here and here. It's, it's a full body experience. If this makes any sense, I know this may sound crazy, but this is just how it is. I realize now what I need to do, where I should be, and my helping other people and the counseling is the main thing. That is the long time term gold. At the moment, I will do the best I can. Trust me, I'm gonna be crocheting and doing everything I can to support myself the moment I get out the door. <clears throat> but the thing is, is some people may fuss about coming here, but sometime coming here is what needed to happen for you to become what God wanted you to be, not what you wanted you to be. Because sometimes we kind of get caught up in the wrong things and we're not seeing. And uh, all I can say is I'm going to do the best I can. And I know I will be helping others. There's no doubt on that one. All right. Well, thank you much. I think we're prepared to vote. Ms. Jackson will be voting first. Uh, Ms. Fleming, I, I'm glad to see that you're uh, mentoring and you're doing some positive things. Uh, I commend you uh, for the things uh, that you've done. I commend you from, from getting your associate's degree from NOPBS and the programs that you've taken. But I do have some concerns and they revolve around your transition plan. My ten transition plan is awesome. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, question. Uh, I think you need to work with the trans um, transition specialist <clears throat> to get it nailed down. Mm -hmm. If your aunt is 80 years old, she can be here today, gone tomorrow. She's very so, old. I think you need to have a better transition plan in place, mm -hmm. particularly considering the fact that you're in a wheelchair. You're going to need a lot of assistance uh, once you're released. And I just don't know that right now you have that. And so my vote today is to deny, but to encourage you to get with the transition team and try to come up with a definitive transition plan, start the ICOT process uh, to Mississippi, and then apply again when you're eligible. That's my vote. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lemon, I, I too want to commend you on, on the work that you've done um, to help, uh, helping others, but I, I don't, feel like you have done all the healing that you need to do. Uh, that, that's me thinking that. But my vote is the same uh, for the same reasons. But reapply, as soon as, you, as soon as you're eligible, reapply with a more concrete plan of how you can live successfully. That's what she's doing. Well, I'm 63 years uh, old. Ma'am, it's my turn to vote. Uh, Ms. Fleming, do you like to talk? Sorry. <laughs> I don't uh, know if Right now, well, listen, it's okay. It's, it's not. It's time for us to talk. I was willing to give you a chance. I voted for you, obviously, at the pardon hearing. I'm a, I too am concerned about your transition plan. I'm concerned. We do have some indication in the record that your residence would be with your aunt, um, but I would have liked to see her. Seen her today. I know probably navigating Zoom is probably probably not one of her um, skill sets. So. Um, but I'd be willing to give you a chance once you have an approved residence and transition plan by probation and parole. So my vote would be to grant with that in mind. However, you've received two votes to deny um, with the encouragement to, to get with the transition specialist to, to work on fine-tuning that plan and reapply when you're eligible to do so. We wish you well. Good luck, ma'am. The only place I have to go with all my medical issues, the other places. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. So that concludes our business. Uh, yeah.
Okay, so in this unpacking, we're going to do two things. One is we're going to go watch the commutation of her co-defendant. Maybe we'll get some more facts out of that. We'll also, before we watch her co-defendant's commutation, we'll review um, her appeal. So we'll probably get more facts out of that as well. But man, this hearing is just... It, it took me for a loop. I'm trying to figure out, and I think the board was as well, is is she, you know, not all there? Is she missing a few screws in the shed? And it turns out that she doesn't have any. She's not in some special ward for that. She doesn't have any diagnosed mental illness, dementia. It's like she's not checking those boxes. And I, it's just, we're all just, I know I'm confused. I'm like, parts of her of what she's saying it just felt like lies like pathological lies like how the how the war was it the warden no the, or the da that wrote the letter and she's talking about it like it's absolutely there but you know at the same time it, it, it sounded just like what she was talking about her aunt and and her her aunt was very real um it's just the whole thing was so far-fetched i mean picked up by so what did you learn I learned that I'm not God. Is that what she said? I'm like, well, and also I just, I couldn't help but think, and it doesn't, she, I mean, God, that kind of looks like Trump, right? President Trump. I mean, I'm not, if he just, I'm, I'm just saying, I like the, the look and everything. Um, I, I don't, oh man, it was just, just so bizarre. And remember, you know, she got, she had her sentence commuted. So at some point she had life. They decided to commute her sentence, recommend it to the governor. The governor signed off on it, but now they can't find her anywhere to go. And, you know, if you want to look at, there are some parts of, of, of the thing where, where it was a bit scary. She's not taking accountability. She's like kind of like conspiracy type stuff and all over the place. And in that sense, it's kind of scary. I mean, imagine sending her to live with her, with an elderly 80 year old like it, it it there's a lot of this that is that is that that is kind of scary but then on the flip side you know you keep someone locked you know it's not like you know do you really think do you think she's a threat i don't know there are parts of this that are kind of but but just to do it on assumptions um this is the kind of thing that the parole project should be involved in, right? But where are they? <laughs> Maybe they don't want to deal with her. But uh, let's go over the facts. And then again, we'll we'll go to her co-defendant commutation hearing. You know, so again, it's not a parole hearing for the for his co-defendant. It's a commutation hearing, but it's facts. So remember, this takes place November 18, 1986. I mean, we're talking, this is 38 years ago, 37 years ago. This is such, you know, um, at approximately 9.30 p.m., George Fleming was was, was shot. Um, it, it was a homicide. He was His life was taken in the driveway adjacent to his apartment on... Uh, on this street, he was shot five times with a 45 caliber. Um, he lived there with his wife, Carlene, and he, and a um, and Christopher, a young man that that Fleming had befriended. Well, that that's never <laughs> that doesn't ever sound like a good like a good uh, a good situation. A young married couple with a young man. Okay. Thomas Peck, a neighbor who witnessed the shooting, stated he only saw a dark silhouette do the shooting. There was no other witnesses to the shooting, although at the time the shooting, Mrs. Fleming and Enos were inside the apartment. Or was it Enos? Um, they admitted hearing the shots and Fleming's screams. The next day, the police officer investigated the homicide were informed by another officer, Sal de Vincinetti, that his wife's cousin, Patricia Gore, also referred to as Trisha, had information about the homicide. Patricia, who was 15 years old, dated Mrs. Fleming's younger brother, Bill. Patricia informed the police that she met Mrs. Fleming and Enos approximately a week earlier at the Smolin household. Mrs. Fleming stated that Enos was her boyfriend. Mrs. Fleming told her about the problem that she was having with her husband, including attempts by him to shoot and poison her. 
and his suspected homosexuality and drug use. Mrs. Fleming also told her that her days were numbered and she wanted to get rid of her husband. It's kind of funny because she it's almost like she was about to talk about how she was afraid of herself from Miss Jet, you know? It's like she's sticking to the same script. Patricia testified that Mrs. Fleming asked if she knew someone who could off her husband because Mrs. Fleming had been told that Patricia's father was in the mafia and her brother in the Ku Klux Klan. Wow, okay. Patricia admitted disclosing this information to Bill, but that it was a lie. Patricia told Mrs. Fleming that she might know someone who would be willing to do it and gave her the name of Steedy Wubas, a former boyfriend with whom she was still friends. Mrs. Fleming asked Patricia to get in touch with him. Enos also asked Patricia to help Mrs. Fleming with her problems. It's funny. This story is, is like as bizarre and confusing and wacky as you'd expect from seeing this parole hearing. Like it really is. Uh, man. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, Patricia later called Steedy and told Mrs. Fleming's proposition. Steedy had with him two friends, Zane, Brian, and Brian D'Antoni, referred to as Brian. Steedy thought Patricia was joking. Later, Mrs. Fleming called and told them of her offer. She would pay $1,000 to have her husband off. 1000 bucks. All of this. $1,000. And would supply the weapon. At some later point, Robert Kosich and Jason LaFrance joined the three younger men and the details of the murder scheme were settled. I mean, I guess it's about, what, $10,000 in those days? Yeah, totally worth it, right? On November 7, 1986, three young men, oh, they get to share, share, share the, the 10000 between three of them, uh, showed up at the home of Mrs. Fleming's parents and Patricia. There at the time, Patricia testified that the three men were Steedy, Zane, and Robert Cossage. Mrs. Fleming's mother testified that she could identify only one of them, which was Steedy. Patricia stated she had not previously known Zane or Cossage. She did not know why they were there and that they spoke to Bill Small. And Patricia called Mrs. Fleming's and told her Steedy was with her. Steedy broke with Fleming and the trio left. The trio, along with Brian and Jason, went to Fleming's apartment. Zane stated the Cossage sat outside with a shotgun for a time. Enos testified that Kosich came to the door of the apartment wielding a shotgun, that Kosich said he thought George Fleming would answer the door, and that he, Kosich, was going to shoot them, to shoot him then. All five, now it's five young men, where, where did I miss that? All five young men later went into the apartment where they met Mrs. Fleming and Enos. They negotiated payments for the homicide of George Fleming, and they were offered money. It's just funny how like it turned into like just a couple people and then all and that's like five. Yeah, you're really gonna get away with this. Just basically like uh you know, you, you have you have you basically have a baseball team over here planning this thing. And um so they were offered money, furniture, clothing, and guns. <laughs> just so ridiculous. The next day, Mrs. Fleming gave them a 45 caliber pistol owned by her husband. Oh, that's smart. She then told them she was going to send her husband to the grocery store at night and shoot him when he returned. On the evening of November 18th, the five young men were riding around in Costas's mother's car. I mean, you just, it would be a comedy. This would be like a really funny movie if, if someone's life wasn't taken. Like you should have had just these dunces driving around and like keep failing to do it. And it would have at least been funny, right? But it, it's... It's just crazy. Um, they're riding around in the mother's car. They drove to Fleming's apartment. In the meantime, Mrs. Fleming picked up her husband from work and they returned to the apartment. Fleming left to go to the grocery store. The five young men saw Fleming return from the grocery store and cautious exited the car carrying the 45 pistol. The four who stayed in the car drove around and heard shots. For right? and you needed all five of them to, to one of them. It's just so stupid. They were informed that someone had been killed on the trap of the street. They left Costas behind and returned home. Yeah. 
The day after the homicide, Miss Fleming and her mother Shirley called Patricia to tell her that Fleming had been shot by a black man. And not to worry, Mrs. Fleming and Mrs. Swollen went to the flower shop where Patricia's mother, Jarjean, worked and told her that they needed to, to speak with Patricia. Later, Mrs. Fleming and Mrs. Smolin arrived at the at the Gord household and told Patricia that she would be given the money because Mrs. Fleming believed she was being watched. <laughs> oh, gosh. Later that night, Patricia told the police that, that all she knew, uh, which resulted in the arrest of Mrs. Fleming, you know, it's cost it Ms. Swollen, Steedy, Zane, Brian, and Jason. Mrs. Small and subsequently pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact. And Steedy, Zane, Brian, and Jason pled guilty to conspiracy to commit. Homicide, Enos, originally charged with first degree, later pled guilty to manslaughter and conspiracy to commit. I mean, it's like it's like legit the three, well, the five stooges even more because you have it, it, the whole thing. La like they got away with it for like about uh, uh, for about like what four hours i mean it's just for a night it, it's just so after his arrest enos gave a statement to the police and told him that of the scheme to homicide fleming at the hearing on the motion to suppress his confession you know testified that the police coerced him into making that statement and that none of it was true oh wow that's real convincing at trial enos testified he lied at the motion to suppress hearing because mrs fleming's parents pressured him to do so Mrs. Fleming testified that she and her husband did have some problems and admitted that one night as she lay in bed, her husband held a gun to her head. As to his poisoning her, she testified that one night a glass of wine had a metallic taste and it caused her to become nauseated. She further testified, however, that she was pregnant at the time and that she might have been the reason for her nausea. Like, what, oh my gosh. Um, Mrs. Fleming testified that a few days before she met Patricia, uh, three young men walked into her apartment without knocking. I told her that they had been told by a friend she had a problem and needed help. She thought that they were friends of her brother, and she told them to go home, and they did. She identified two of the young men as Didi and Zayna described the third young man as looking as Harpo Marks. <laughs> looking like Harpo Marks. Oh, my gosh. You know, I can just see her today saying that. And not like Robert Cossage. On the night before the homicide, she received a telephone call, and the caller told her that her husband would have been shot that night, but they could not get a clear shot. Miss Fleming testified that the late morning of the day of the homicide, the three men had visited her before uh, met her and Enos outside of the apartment, and they told her that they needed to talk to her because their friend wanted them to talk to her. She told them that she was not interested and told them to leave. On the evening of the homicide, she picked up her husband from work, and they went home. Miss Mr. Fleming went to the grocery store, and Enos sat there in the living room and told him sometimes later, she heard a car backfire with the Fleming's car tended to do, and she told Enos to go get help and unload the groceries. They heard a shot followed by a scream and then more shots and screams. Enos went out to see what happened and found George Fleming lying dead. On the day after the homicide, Mrs. Fleming and her mother looked for Patricia so that she could help calm Bill Smolin, who was extremely upset by the homicide. They went to the floor shop and spoke to Mrs. Gore and went to Gore's household and he spoke to Patricia about Bill. Peggy Cossage and the sister of Robert Cossage testified her brother was home the entire evening before the homicide and was home by the day of the homicide. However, as the night of the homicide, she did not know if Cossage took their mother's car. Two days after the homicide, police seized a 45 caliber pistol from the sewing room at the Cossage household. Wow. Uh, I mean, I don't know why I'm saying wow. It's I'm, We're not surprised by, you know... You, you expect everything about this joke of a, of a plot. Phil Jemison, a friend, I mean, I'm only surprised he didn't like write it down. We did it, right? Phil Jemison, a friend of George Fleming's, testified that the gun was the one he exchanged with Fleming in 1980 for one of Fleming's guns. Um, so all as ridiculous as you'd expect after seeing that parole hearing, which is pretty amazing that someone, you know, you can actually see see probably what she got like she probably has not changed an ounce since the day that she planned this you know it goes through a lot i'll drop the link in the description i think what we're going to do now is go jump towards her co-defendants here which uh which took place april 11th 2023 so not so long ago i'm actually not 100 percent sure which co-defendant so let's find out now robert cossage 12 12. 
All right, Mr. Costage, you're here before the pardon board this morning requesting a commutation of your sentence. So Robert Cossage, let's just remember who that is real quick so we can have some context because there were five involved, right? So Robert Cossage was, um, what was his, was his, uh, next day police officers from informed by another, so there was Da Vinci's, there was Patricia Gore, Patricia, there was, um, So there was Dwight Dosky, uh, Harvey, Clyde Merritt, New Orleans defendant for Robert Cossage. Um, oh, so Robert Cossage was the young man who looked like Harper Marx, not like Robert Cossage. Um, I'm trying to think who was the one that, that pulled the trigger. I don't know if it was Robert, but okay, let's go check out the hearing. Cause I'm not, um, Okay, so it was here. So in the meantime, the five young men filming returned from the grocery store and cautious exited the car in the 45. So it was him. So he was the one who got out of the car with the 45 and and fired the shots. So he is the one. So now let's jump, let's jump into this there. Since you're classified as a first offender. You were sentenced in November 1988 out of Orleans Parish for second degree murder and you received a life sentence. Is that information correct, Mr. Possible? Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Cossage. Morning, Mr. Roche. Good. Mr. Cossage, I want to do a presentation and I'm going to ask you some questions during the presentation. And uh, just sit back and relax and we're going to have a conversation, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chairman, fellow board members, we have Robert Cossage, DOC number 12512. He's here this morning seeking a recommendation for a commutation of sentence, for a second degree murder conviction that he received in 1988. The applicant is currently 57 years old at the time of his offense. He was 21 and he's been incarcerated since November of 1986 for approximately 35 and a half years. On the evening of November 18, 1996, the applicant, Robert Carsons, did carry out a planned murder of Mr. George Flemings. In front, of his, in front of his apartment complex in New Orleans, Louisiana, by shooting the victim five times. The last four shots were fired after the victim was laying on the ground. The fifth shot was a shot directly to his head, which proved to be fatal. The offense was calculated and premeditated. A conspiracy involving the offender, the victim's wife, Colleen Flemings, the victim's mother-in-law, the wife's living boyfriend, and a number of the applicant's friends, mostly the juveniles at the time. There were a lot of juveniles involved in this murder and Mr. Carson was 21 and basically uh, 
we involved some individuals into the process in the planning of the murder that was uh, really underage. Mr. Kosich, who is Colleen Fleming was the only participant to be convicted and receive a life sentence without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension in sentence. Ms. Ms. Colleen Flemings is still incarcerated at the Department of Corrections and has applied for clemency on two different occasions. And on both occasions, Ms. Flemings She's been denied. Other adult participants received much lighter sentence. All juveniles that participated in the planning and executing of the murder of Mr. Flemings received a juvenile life sentence and were released at the age of 18. The applicant has five adult arrests and three juvenile arrests on his criminal record. Two of the juvenile arrests involve mental health evaluations. Do you remember those juvenile arrests, Mr. Kosich? Yes, sir. And indicated on the record that you received a mental health evaluation for two of those arrests. Do you remember what the diagnosis was? No, sir. Okay. But you did receive mental health evaluations when you were given. Yes, sir. You were sentenced, I think, in February of 1988, is that correct? Yes, sir. And about 25 days after you were sentenced, on February 4th, 1988, you were arrested in Orleans Parish, I think, for conspiracy to commit simple escape. So tell us what happened 25 days after you were sentenced, that caused you to get arrested for a simple escape. I don't remember being arrested, sir, but uh, two two guys was a uh, offender on B3 that they were apprehended trying to go out the window. I was on B1. I, had, I was an assistant tier rep at that time when I got moved down to B1. I was on B1 for one day, and they. And the SID came and, and uh, apprehended me and put me on the lockdown. I've never been to court or anywhere for that. It was dismissed, but you were arrested. That arrest is on your record as a. Yes, sir. But the charges were dismissed. Yes, sir. Opposition. In this case, it comes from the law enforcement community in New Orleans. Uh, there is no other opposition other than law enforcement opposition in this case. Uh, the victim is deceased, and the victim's wife is incarcerated with the same offense. So there is no opposition other than law enforcement. Mr. Kosich has a low risk assessment. He is in, he's housed in, uh, uh, he's housed in minimum custody. He has a GED. He has certification in outdoor power equipment with electrical uh, systems technology, two stroke technology and four stroke technology. He has a good institutional record. He has a transition plan with his mother in St. Bernard, Louisiana, and he has a job waiting for him in the seafood industry. 
is involved with P A W S R, and that is in connection with the Wounded Warrior Service. Tell us about that project where you train service animals for veterans. Yes, sir. We take rescue dogs from shelters and donations, and we and within 14 months, we'll have them trained for a wounded veteran that suffers from brain trauma, PTSD, mobility issues. We've even trained one for a lady that has issues, that has sexual trauma from the military. Thank you so much. Uh, how long have you been working with this project? I worked, this is this this dog I have now is my second dog. My first dog was adopted out to a veteran. I've assisted with two others and we pass them on. You know, we, we bring them to a certain point and then we have to pass them on to be certified. So uh, you I've been like eight years. No, eight. not not eight or oh, five years. Five years. Okay. Sure. Uh, Mr. Carson is also involved with Camp J Unity Club. Tell us about the Unity Club. Camp J is, is shut down at the moment for re renovations, but we, we keep the club open for the population. You know, it's, it's the Unity Club represents the, the population, the inmate population. And we try to give back on whatever we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, programs that Mr. Carson has completed, 100 hours pre-release, anger management, rage and cage of rage, living in balance, parts one and two, victim awareness. He's uh, composed a victim accountability letter and many, many faith-based programs. Mrs. Carson, at this time, would you like to mention any other programs or involvements that you have at Louisiana State Penitentiary? One of the first ones I've entered was the juvenile awareness. I think that was in 92. You know, it was very eye-opening to, to speak with the kids, you know, and try to explain to them not to do what I've done, don't be a follower. Think for yourself. That's like victim of awareness and thinking for a change should be taught in schools. Thank you. Mr. Carsage has six, three disciplinary write-ups in 35 years of incarceration, an average of almost two write-ups for every year of incarceration. But the last disciplinary write-up was almost eight years ago. It was a 30W on August 8th of 2014. Mm -hmm. Tell me what the behavior was for that write-up. I was wrote up for indecent uh, behavior in a hobby shop. What did you do? It said I was having sex in the hobby shop by myself. Okay. I had no no other person with me. Okay. Your last writer was eight years ago. Yes, sir. Afternoon this morning, what event or events or good time programs led to the turnaround? Where you had 63 write ups in the last eight years, you've had done. Just about every program I've been in educates me. You know, the more educated I become, the better person I become. So, thinking for a change, 100 hours, just hang. Hanging out with positive people, going to the Judson Bible study, just being around positive people is 
the change. If, if, you, if you run with negative people, you'll be a negative person. But if, if you run, if you hang and you live, you live your life with positive people, you'll be a positive person. Mr. Carson, you were 21 years old when you committed this crime. Yes, sir. Did drugs or alcohol play any part in this particular crime? No, sir. I was, I've never done hard drugs in my life. I've smoked marijuana and I social drink, you know, with, with, with the, the, the fellas. I've never done no hard drugs or, or any hard drinking. Mr. Carson, I need to know why Speedy and Mr. D'Antoni, once they found out what was this, this fluid warning, they contacted you to do the, uh, the, the shooting. Why were you contacted? I wasn't contacted. It was just bad fate. Me and Zane, one, one of the, my father, one of the guys, the accomplices, my friends, we just, he, he decided we was going to the movies. He said, man, let's take a walk by Steedy's trailer. So that's what we did. We went by Steedy's trailer and Zane, Jason, and Brian was there. And that's when it all went wrong. Uh, Mr. 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 Concert, that is, the, that statement you just made came from the statement you submitted with the application. But the police report in the eyewitness account tells a much different story. Say that you were contacted by Mr. D'Antoni and Speedy to do the, um, the murder and you met with uh, Mrs. Flemings, her mother, and her lived-in boyfriend. Yes, we did. Her, she gave you all the details. The next day, you went back, and she gave you the gun with two magazines and told you you would be coming from the grocery the next day. You visited again with her the next day, hours before you killed Mr. Fleming. You said you walked up to the car and you shot him in the car. The actual report says that he, he pulled up, went into the garage, got two bags of groceries, one in each hand, and was walking towards his apartment. You walked up on him, shot him once, he fell to the ground, you shot him three more times, and then shot him in the head. I just kept shooting until I ran out of bullets. Yes, sir. You're very correct. But why would you say in your statement that you walked up to his car and shot him in his car? No, sir, I did not shoot him in his car. He, he, was, he was walking with two bags of groceries. You are correct. Uh, I just find different details in your statement that's not in the official report and statements from eyewitnesses that was in on the planning of Mr. Clemens' murder. I was, I, I, I can remember it to this day, exactly how it happened. It, it happened then, exactly I don't as, need, I, as I just said. Sir? It happened just as I just stated. Yes, sir. You are correct. Uh, Warren Fargo, would you like to make any comments, remarks, observations at this time? Yes, sir. You, you've been very thorough, Mr. Roche, in, uh, in, in putting your case on. Uh, uh, Pentecostal has been, uh, he was a 
me and A uh, originally back in October of 2001, and the write-up that you spoke of in 14, uh, he was moved back down to a medium, and uh, later on in that year of, of 2014, got his men A back. Uh, since then, no write-ups has done a good job for us in the capacity of uh, groundskeeping out at Camp J, um, going through a small engine repair and then continuing to work uh, for us in that capacity as well to provide small engine repair uh, at ASNR as well as uh, in its capacity of, of working with the, uh, the grass crew. Thank you, Lord. Sure. Mayor Chairman, uh, like a brief executive session at the end of the interview to discuss confidential matters. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Ms. Jackson has some questions. Good morning, Ms. Passage. My name is Bonnie Jackson. Um, yes, when you interacted with me, did you know Mrs. Fleming before this whole process began? No, ma'am. When you talked to her, what reason did she give you uh, that she wanted or needed her husband uh, killed? What was your understanding of why she wanted her husband killed? He said he was abusing her. She said uh, he was abusing her. And her mother was present? Later that night, we went by her mama's house. And did the mother add anything to the discussion about why Mr. Fleming uh, should be killed? Yes, she did. She said what that. She uh, said, she said that uh, Carlene's front, uh, husband was abusing her. All right. And you were twenty-one years old at that time. No, no, ma'am. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think he was thirty, you, thirty-five. You, I was twenty-one. Yes, ma'am. What made you agree to, to be a part of this? There's no excuse for stupidity. I, know, I, I understand, but what, at the time, what made you feel like that was something that you would do? Hank, uh, I'm trying to impress the fellas. I'm trying to impress my friends. It's, I have no excuse for myself. And did you believe Mrs. Fleming when she said she was being abused? Yes, ma'am. I don't. I don't. I did not know Mr. George or, or Mrs. Fleming. I didn't know nobody over there. That was Stevie's friends. All right. Well, thank you. That's all I have, uh, Ms. Fossey. That's all I have, Ms. Renata. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Passage, now we'll hear from your guests. Let's hear from Ms. Molly Crespo. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was muted. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to know he's the best uncle I've ever had, no matter what, where he's been. He's one of the most positive people and influences in my life. He keeps me on track and puts me in my place when I act out or mean to my mom. Uh, he's always writing me positive letters, making sure I stay out of trouble and don't do anything stupid like he did. And I just think he's a really amazing person. I, I think he's done his time and I think he's ready to be a part of society and a good part of society. Stay to himself, work, be our working man, just be the good person he is. Even though he made a stupid mistake very many years ago. Yes, ma'am, thank you. We appreciate your uh, remarks this morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to speak to Ms. Peggy Passage, or hear from her rather. Uh, she was not able to join on toe, but that was your sister who uh, has expressed her um, 
support for you, Mr. Passage, to unable to join. So I'd like to hear your statement if you have one. I'd like to thank the board for, for this opportunity and show as much remorse as I can for my unnecessary actions of bad judgment. I, I, I can't, I have no excuse for myself, man. You know, I'm just, I don't know how to express regret. You know, that's something you can really teach. It's just something you feel. I can't say it. I could feel it. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Roche has made a motion for executive session. Could we get a uh, roll call vote? Uh, you second. Well, I first will need a second to the motion for executive session by Ms. Jackson. Ms. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Roche? Yes. Ms. Manassa? Yes. Mr. Marabella? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Kosich will be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. We'll be right back. See you. All right, Mr. Kosich, we are back in regular session. We are prepared to vote. We'll start with Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Cossage, you have done very well, especially the last eight years. You, you started off kind of rough, 63 disciplinary write ups, and um, what, almost 25, 26 years. But in the last eight years, you have received no disciplinary write ups. And basically, you say it was because of the programs and the environment and the people that you associated with while incarcerated. Warren uh, Falco has given you a positive uh, review. Uh, you have acquired a vocational skill, uh, not only certified with the electrical engine, but Two cycle, two stroke, and four cycle uh, engines. Uh, you have a good transition plan with your brother, and I think a job is waiting on you. Good programs based on all those factors. My recommendation is to commute. Well, my recommendation is to recommend to the government to commute. The sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Panel, thank y'all. Mayor Bella. Wait, you gotta wait. We got He's only one vote. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Cossage, uh, I agree with everything that uh, Mr. Roche has said. Uh, my vote would be the same uh, to recommend that the governor commute the sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I agree with both of my colleagues and I also vote to grant and uh, immediate eligibility for parole. Ms. Jackson. Thank you, sir. Mr. Passage, um, you have done well um, during your incarceration. Uh, my vote today would be recommended commutation to 99 years of parole eligibility. Thank you, ma'am. And Mr. Kosich, you had a good interview today. I, I honestly uh, will say that reviewing the record, I didn't think the interview would go so well, but you had a good interview today. You had positive remarks from the warden, uh, family support, and a good institutional record, and you do some community service work. So my vote today also is to make the recommendation as has been stated by my colleagues. So we will make that recommendation on your behalf. Uh, good luck to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I, I had to go back and double check because I thought maybe I misheard it, but he actually made his final statement. He said, and maybe you heard it too, 
But what he said shocked me. He said, I don't know how to express regret. It's not something you can teach. It's something you feel. I can't say I can feel it. He told the board in his final words that he doesn't feel regret because he can't. I, I don't know if it, he misspoke, if it was like he's just nervous and he didn't mean to say what he said, but... I mean, what did I just hear? I, I, you know, and I don't know if the board was ever going to not approve him. I don't know why they thought he had a good interview, though, either. It was, you know, remember, they're, they're just recommending it to the governor. So we're about to watch his parole hearing. You can see um, <laughs> Carrie Myers over here. His parole hearing it took place like a year later. Uh and for the most part, they're shoe-ins, although, you know, like very, very few we see not get approved, although we just saw his co-defendant right before get commuted by the governor and get denied. So, you know, we'll have to watch it. But um, I, I just, I don't know. I can't. You know, I didn't hear remorse in anything you did. He didn't hear it in his voice. He explained what he did. He was the, you know, he was the older guy. He was the cool guy. Um, he said he did it because he wanted to feel tough, which I believe that, you know, like that's the reasoning that he did it. I don't think there was really any other reason for him to do it. And, uh, It's, you know, when, you, when you, I guess when you don't have like victim opposition come up and actually speak, it's um, you just need to completely not flunk the interview. Although I thought with that final statement that it was kind of scary, unless you're just saying, you know what? I mean, I don't know, he kind of, the interview was a bit scary the way he did it, the way it's like, even, even the way he spoke about his last write-up in the, in the hobby shop doing that. Um, man, it, it's, uh, here's a, a picture Richard found of him, man, if you're going to be in prison, this has got to be the best job to train puppies, right? Inmate Robert Kosich left Lee's Fern across an incline ramp, Stevenson. This was in 2022. Training dogs for military veterans. I mean, that's got to be awesome. But uh, let's go see his final hearing. And I don't know if I have anything to comment. We'll do that. Okay. The first time a felony offender he has a parole eligibility date of March the 2nd of 2023, a good time a release date of May 21st of 2036, and a full term date of November 21st of 2085. He is currently serving a 99-year sentence for second-degree murder, having originally been sentenced to life and commuted by the governor to 19 to 99 years. Is that information basically correct, Mr. Kosich? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kosage, your case has been assigned to Ms. Pearl Wise, so she will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. How's it going? That's fine. It's a pretty day. It's a pretty day. Yes, it, yes, it is. Good um, day. So, so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Call out for the record how long you've been in jail. You served on this sentence. I was arrested in 1986. I got convicted in 1988. Okay, all righty. Um, and as has already been stated, you went before the pardon board and they granted because of the uh, <clears throat> the comments from the warden and uh, your program and your skill, your skill levels. And your last write-up was in 2014. Uh, I saw that you recently took victim awareness. Is that correct? In 2021? Yes, ma'am. 
Tell me what you learned in victim awareness. That our crime doesn't just impact us, you know, so just me and the victim. It, it affects the community, the families of, of the victims, my family. It, it affects my friends, you know, how we, we were all situated. It affects, it's, it's a wave effect. You know, the ripples keep going and going and going. It's, you know, my stupidity affects a lot of people. I, yeah. Now, I do want to state on the record that uh, that the uh, the victim's uh, relatives are unopposed to your early release. There's nothing you can do about that. I just want to state that on the record. Uh, so tell us your plans uh, if you were successful today. Where would you live and how would you support yourself? I'd like to go back home. Uh, uh, my sister has recently passed away and she left me the house and properties. You know, so I have home. You know, I, I can stay with my, my other sister, you know, if I just needed to. Okay. I'm going to start out with the parole project with Mr. Ms. Myers and Mr. Andrew Huntley. Okay. You know, they, they're going to show me how to reintegrate back into society because society has moved on since I've been arrested, since I've been incarcerated. You know, a lot of digital I've never been exposed to. I've never owned a cell phone in my life. I'm just not getting into tech the media. I take computer classes in the mornings to, to learn something. So that when I get out, I'll be able to be, you know, not lost. But uh, I, I can work. Okay. I can do heavy equipment. I can do construction. I can do offshore. I can do commercial fishermen. You know, I've pretty much my skills are rounded. I'm a very good yard person. I can do landscaping. I've learned a lot over my years. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Robert, tell us how old are you today? I'm 57. I'll be 58 in November. All right. Very good. All right. Very good. All right. That's that's all I have. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. Uh, Ward, what can you tell us? Uh, Ms. Wise, uh, he's been doing well here. Uh, like you said, he hasn't had a ride up in several years since 2014. Uh, he's uh, going through quite a few programs. Uh, the only thing that I would recommend is uh, I know he went to victim awareness. I would recommend victim impact. Uh, other than that, he's been doing well. All right. Thank you, Warden. Thank you, Warden. We appreciate your comments. Uh, now let's hear from. Uh, Molly Crespo, I'm sorry. I would said Princess Molly, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently, that's the, the device that you're on, okay? This is uh, it is. Crespo. I'm sorry, Ms. Crespo. I'm sorry. It just automatically goes to that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Molly. Uh, that's Mal Karabi. He is probably one of the best people I know with one of the biggest hearts. He's been there my whole life. He might be, sorry, in prison my whole life, but he's never not been there. He's my best friend. He steers me in the right direction. He's the biggest lecturer, but they come to the heart and they've helped me become the person I am today and not go down the wrong tracks and stand up and be a better person, be good to my parents, learn. Other people's feelings matter over my own. Uh, he's put God first. He's just, he really is an amazing person. I feel like he's learned his lesson. He's very missed and very loved. And I would love to see him come home and get to see him more than just once a year and talk to him on the phone. I think he'd be very good. He's got a job lined up, a house. He's got family who's behind him 100%. Everything he needs to come home and just live a better life and be different in society. And oh, I'm sorry, I'm very emotional. It's okay. <laughs> Doing well. I just said, I really think he's he's ready. He's done a lot. I'm so proud of him doing all this schooling. He's every time he calls me, he's in a different class and. 
he's trying his hardest to learn the most. So when he comes back out, he can do more with his life than he was able to before. Thank you very much, man. We appreciate your comments. Now we hear from Mr. Meyer. Yeah. Good morning, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, we are certainly prepared to assist Mr. Kosich in his transition. One of the things that I believe that we can excel in right now is our EEP program, our Employment Enhancement Program, uh, where we have a, now have a team that does nothing but connecting people with the skills that Mr. Kosich has with um, industries and, and available and available jobs. Additionally. Uh, we'll provide him uh, transitional service and social norms uh, to help him adjust uh, to the changes in society. Uh, technology, the, uh, our four levels of technology classes, uh, which will also help him get prepared. Um, additionally, we'll make sure he's connected to any every service uh, that's available to him. And, and of course, we'll work with his family uh, when he is, he is ready and he's completed our, our program and he is ready to transition back to his, his long-term residence. We'll work closely with his family to ensure that's seamless. Thank you, Mr. Myers. We appreciate your comments. Mr. Uh, Kossett, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before the board votes? I just want to thank y'all for the, the pardon, everything. I got, when I, I got arrested, I had no, you know, I was in a lost state. I was young and very uh, not, not in the right right mind, but uh, Angola actually gave me a lot of opportunities to grow and better myself. Even though I was in in a very bad environment, you know, I, I don't do drugs. I have I don't smoke. I have no habits. You know, so I believe I came out. You know, even though. Mr. Uh, Fleming lost his life. You know, that's there's there's no amount of time that I can do to pay for that. There's it really it really isn't. You know, because the man paid for, for my stupidity, you know. And there's I'm lost at words to say how sorry that I am for from my juvenilistic time. Yes. I just, just sorry. I'm just sorry, man. It's very remorseful. Thank you very much, sir. Is the panel ready to vote? Yes. Ms. Wise? Uh, Mr. Robert, I, I want to thank you for doing the work to change yourself, to not be that human that committed that crime. I appreciate you for that. Uh, the programs can be there. They can be all over the place. But if you don't take advantage of them like you did, I, and it, I'm just, I just want to thank you for being wise enough, like what your niece said, now, and then you're sharing it with her, what you've learned. That's, that's, uh, that's good to see. My vote is to grant today conditionally, like the warden said, after you complete the victim impact program. Now, I hope you get a chance to finish all your computer classes as well. Uh, and to the Louisiana Parole Project has been set forth, and you stay with them, uh, and they would, you know, for the period of time that they find appropriate, then you can transition. Uh, because of your, you know, because of the, uh, your excellent, the warden's comments and your uh, excellent institutional adjustment, it was also mentioned your good vocational skills. So best wishes to you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, my vote is also to grant and to go through the parole project. And I'm sure Mr. Myers and them will do some evaluations on you and you are to follow any recommended treatment that the parole project orders. Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Uh, Kosich, my vote is the same, to grant conditionally upon your completing the victim impact program and then going to the Louisiana Parole Project and following all of their recommendations. Good luck to you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Not much else added except uh, they're saying just one more program. I mean, you've been locked up for like 38 years or whatever, but just one more program, uh, some victim awareness stuff. It's like, whatever, you know, it's, uh, it, it's sometimes you just have to, 
You just have to laugh. It, the whole thing, it's so silly. It's like, really? Oh, yeah, one more program. That's really, that's just what he needs. Now, there are, I guess, certain things that are, that, that, that it's a good term is that we do see hearings where someone has spent 30, 40 years in prison and they've done nothing with their time. They have put in no effort into the rehabilitation. They've done no programs. They have dozens or hundreds of write-ups. They, you know, it, it's, so I try to remind myself it's, it's to, to appreciate when someone does put in the effort, which it seems he, he clearly is making the best of his situation possible. Um, but I, it's probably is also the best re, you know, reason for the parole project to exist, right? He needs help getting out there. Uh, he's lucky he has his niece there supporting him through the big, you know, thick and thin. It's imagine having to do this alone. Right. But, um, and what, what did he also say that? He was, he was left the house too, or is that something that I am confusing with another hearing? I don't know. Um, do you think that he should be let out? You know, he's, he doesn't seem to be the sharpest tool in the shed. Is low IQ, does he have a low IQ? I don't know. Is it has something to do with it? Do you think he's a, I, I think the biggest question you ask is, it, is he a risk? Doesn't feel that way. And uh, and is there a victim opposition? I, I know they like mentioned it, but you don't see it, feel it. So you might say if anyone should get out, it should be him. But you tell me. I I I I personally I'm leaning for you know letting him out. It's it's hard to to really hate on him. Um, but thank you, Richard, for the info. And it's, yeah, it's almost hard to remember that we, that we saw his co-defendant just, uh, at the beginning of this, she's still locked up. It's been a while on this hearing, but, uh, yeah. Thank you, Richard, for stringing it all together. It makes it easy to connect these dots. And with that, I'll let you go.